Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'd like to welcome you to the Campfire Chat organized by the Carnegie Climate Governance Initiative on the topic of governance gaps for large-scale carbon dioxide removal. Uh, we have five experts, guest speakers with us to share their experience and more importantly, their different perspectives on these issues. In a moment, I will ask them to self-introduce themselves. Uh, I just want to remind the participants that uh, this is going to be a discussion around a virtual campfire. We won't have long speeches, uh, slide presentations. The emphasis really is on discussion and uh, first within the guest speakers and then uh, answering your questions. Uh, so let me start by introducing myself. I am Janusz Pastor. I'm the executive uh, director of the C2G of the Carnegie Climate Governance Initiative. I've been doing this since uh, 2016. Uh, before that, I was with the UN. My last position was uh, Assistant Secretary General for Climate Change. Uh, I've worked with various United Nations uh, and non-governmental organizations over the years. Uh, and it's now pretty much four decades of work on climate change. Uh, and in fact, I worked with uh, uh, pretty much everyone on this panel in one capacity or another, whether it was with WWF or with uh, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change or the UN Environment Program or other uh, places where I worked. Uh, but uh, as I said, I've been working on this for four decades and clearly uh, what we see on climate change is, is doesn't give us a good uh, uh, report card. So I, I certainly feel that I, 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 the job is unfinished and there's still a few things left to be done. And I hope that our discussion will contribute to that. So with that, uh, can I ask Thelma, please uh, introduce yourself. Yes, thanks Jano. And uh, I am Thelma Krug and uh, I was a former senior researcher at the National Institute for space research in Brazil. And uh, for 13 years, I have been a uh, co-chair of the IPCC uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Task Force on National Greenhouse Gas Inventories. And then on 2015, uh, I was elected one of the three vice chairs of the IPCC. For many years, I would say about 13 years, uh, I represented Brazil in the negotiations in the climate change convention and particular on issues related to land use change and forestry. So I think that is basically, basically it, Janos. Thank you. Thank you, Thelma. Uh, Stefan, can I come to you, please? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Janos. Um, <clears throat> Stefan Zinger, I work for Climate Action Network International representing about 1,500 NGOs worldwide in 120 countries, environmental NGOs, development NGOs, face groups, social justice, climate justice, and grassroots groups, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> I work for Climate Action Network International since five years. Before that one, I had been more than 20 years with WWF. I was director energy policy there. And today with CAN, I try to um, advise and help my friends and colleagues in the civil society movements on climate science policy and um, clean energy policy. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, Paul, can I come to you? Sure, good afternoon uh, or good morning or, or whatever it is, wherever people are in the world. Uh, Paul Watkinson, I, I work for the French Ministry of uh, Ecological Transition. Uh, and, and for many years, I, I worked uh, running a, a delegation in the multilateral climate talks under the the united nations framework convention uh, and uh, i was also part of the team that prepared and ran cop 21 where we which produced the paris agreement and in the the past two years 2018 and 2019 um, i was chair of the subsidiary body of scientific and technological cooperation uh, under the climate convention i should stress that i'm speaking very much in a personal capacity and nothing i say uh commits any of the the organizations which i work or, or have worked over time Th thank you paul uh julio can i continue with you please sure yes good morning good, good afternoon good evening uh thank you for for um, for the invitation um my name is julio cordano 
I, uh, I currently, I'm currently the director of Environment and Ocean Affairs in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Chile. Um, I've uh, basically been uh, involved uh, in the UNFCCC negotiations for some time now. Um, I guess the, uh, the, the most important uh, part of that uh, role was uh, as a coordinator of the negotiation team for, for the COP25 presidency. Um, and on that capacity, uh, we were um, we were in, in charge of the uh, uh, of the presidency role in COP25 in, in Madrid. Um, I'm also uh, the uh, an adaptation committee member in the uh, UNFCCC. Um, so uh, that's basically been uh, been uh, my my connection to to, the, to this. Uh, and um, as Paul was saying, I'm also speaking on my personal capacity and. Uh, in this important topic, uh, but uh, none of that, none, none of my, my opinions at the moment can represent or intend to represent the views of, of my government. Thank you. Thank you, Julio. And for going on to Bill, just to say, Thelma, that uh, this is a campfire chat and your cat is totally welcome. So uh, just when she wants to speak, please mention it so we can turn on the interpretation. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Bill, uh, it's your turn. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm Bill Hare, and I'll try and keep my dog out of uh, Thelma's vision. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've been involved with the climate uh, issue now for more than 30 years, I guess. So I started out um, you know, uh, working in Australia. I was actually on the Australian delegation that negotiated the climate convention, then uh, worked for Greenpeace International for a number of years uh, on many aspects of the uh, the climate issue um, before starting climate analytics uh, at the end of 2008, um, based uh, which is headquartered in Berlin. I'm now based in Western Australia, actually partly due to COVID. So I've got a broad experience on the issues. I've also been involved with the IPCC in different capacities, including as a lead author in uh, one of the assessments and so on. Um, so I'm rather interested to hear the different perspectives tonight, including from old friends and colleagues. I'm sure there's going to be quite a lively discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And as you can see, all we have a, a fantastic uh, uh, group of, uh, of guests with us. So I, I also look forward to the discussion. Now, just a, a few words about uh, the Carnegie Climate Governance Initiative. We, we're a foundation uh, philanthropy funded initiative. Uh, we are 16 people working virtually, even before COVID, uh, uh, on three continents. and. Uh, uh, our mission is very simple, it's to catalyze the creation of effective governance frameworks for uh, approaches that can alter the climate, such as carbon dioxide removal or solar radiation modification. Our role is impartial, we about the use or not of these uh, approaches and technologies. Uh, the, and uh, one part of our strategy is to encourage learning through conversations, uh, conversations like the one uh, for example, we're going to have today uh, around this uh, virtual campfire. Now, the purpose of these uh, discussions, these campfire chats, is to really show the diversity of views, the diversity of views based on uh, different political, cultural contexts and experiences that the people we invite have. And, uh, of course, uh, in order to really uh, uh, demonstrate the diversity. We need, of course, as many people on each campfire chat as the diversity, but that's impossible. Uh, so we do the best we can to, to bring in people with different geographical, gender, socio-political backgrounds and so on. Uh, but we obviously can't achieve that at every single uh, uh, webinar and every single uh, campfire chat. But on the whole, I think when we look at that, I think we now have over 50 experts who've been engaged in this process uh, I think we've done uh, pretty well. Now, uh, I encourage our speakers uh, and I encourage the participants to ask uh, challenging questions. But of course, all the views expressed here are those of the guests and not necessarily of uh, the Carnegie Climate Governance Initiative. Um, a few words about the context in which we're meeting, and I, I don't think we, uh, I want to say too much because we have much better speakers here, but it's pretty clear uh, on the one hand, that uh, uh, the climate crisis uh, uh, continues, uh, the impacts are visible wherever you look, whether it's the Arctic, whether it's forest fires, whether it's extreme heat in different parts of the world. 
Uh, and we also know from uh, many scientific studies, including in particular from the IPCC's special report on 1.5 degree and others, that uh, emission reductions must go into absolute full speed. Uh, and even then, even if we are able to maximize our emission reductions, we will still uh, need uh, some level of carbon dioxide removal of some of the carbon dioxide removal approaches in order to be able to maintain uh, the Paris uh, goals. And uh, we need those removals to first uh, uh, reduce, offset the difficult emissions, uh, aiming for net zero. And then we will need those removals to go beyond net zero into the net negative period at some point in the future. Now, the, the unfortunate reality is that the world is not yet in turbo mode for emission reduction. So uh, the relationship between the speed uh, and the uh, amount of carbon, the speed of emission reductions and carbon removal is clearly something we will need to uh, discuss. Uh, now, uh, the, what is interesting uh, as a backdrop to our discussion is that a number of countries have committed themselves to net zero targets by 2050. And uh, then the question arises, what do we, they need to do both on carbon removals themselves and the governance challenges that these issues are posed? And that is what we want to focus our discussion today. Uh, sometimes we, it's unavoidable to get into some technical discussion of the, the different approaches, but what we really want to focus on is what are the governance challenges? What are the gaps in governance uh, that need to be addressed? Uh, why we think that they, those gaps are there and how we can meet them. So, uh, uh, and, and, and how different intergovernmental and other international processes actually address those issues. Uh, so that's what we would like to, con to, to discuss. We will not be able to address all these issues clearly, uh, but we hope to be able to contribute uh, to the discussions. Now, in terms of the mechanics, uh, uh, what will happen is that I will ask each of our guest uh, speakers to say a few words at the beginning, and I will ask a specific question from each one of them. And then uh, there will be a bit of a discussion between the speakers themselves. And then at one point, uh, we will ask, uh, we will start looking at the questions posed by the participants. So dear participants, please start uh, formulating your questions, if you have any and put them on the Q&A uh, bullet of the Zoom functionality. Um, there is also a like button. Uh, so in case you see a question there that you like yourself, uh, click that and that will increase the chances of that particular uh, question being uh, addressed. We'll try to answer all the questions or address all the questions, but of course, if there are too many, uh, we may run out of time. There's also a chat button. You can chat if you like. Uh, but uh, don't put the questions in the chat uh, uh, because uh, we won't be able to necessarily follow all of that. So this is, uh, this is basically the, the plan. And uh, now let's uh, look forward to, to hearing some thoughts from our, our, our guest speakers. And I would like to start with Julio. Uh, Julio, uh, you, you, you mentioned your, your background in this area of work and of course, COP25 presidency. Uh, and in, in that context, how can you best frame uh, the, the, the issue of uh, large-scale carbon dioxide removal, looking at the overall context of mitigation ambition in the agreed international process, which is the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change? So over to you, Julio. Thank you, Janos. Um, yes, it's a very good question. And, and I guess uh, one needs to start uh, uh, you know, uh, put our fingers in the in the fact that uh, we we are really short of ambition. Um, uh, I think one one of the things that that really concern everybody and uh, really keeps the the ball rolling in the process uh, is the fact that we haven't done enough. Is the fact that uh, we have committed ourselves through the Paris Agreement to uh, a long term goal that. Does, is not backed up with enough action and, and enough ambition. Um, and, and, and I should say that, that for, for the moment, we, we have uh, had a discussion about targets, but not necessarily about how to achieve those targets. 
So, so as, as you were rightly saying, I think we have good signs uh, from, from some major emitters uh, that have recently announced that want to achieve carbon neutrality. Some of them uh, before 2060, like China, or some of them by 2050, um, like the European Union and others. Uh, uh, I think the recent announcement from Japan and Korea are also quite exciting and, 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 and a good sign. But at the same time, I, th I think it's, 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 it continues to be a target in the future that is not aligned or it's not accompanied by a clear understanding of how those achievements will be, how those targets will be achieved. Um, so uh, that, that's when, when this conversation comes into, into place because uh, uh, my, my understanding is that the, the, um, the emission reductions is absolutely an, 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 an irreplaceable part of the, of the equation. Uh, and we cannot forget the fact that when we are talking about climate change and reducing, reducing emissions, we're not talking only about uh, lowering the pressure on the carbon budget in the atmosphere, but we're talking about the transition towards an economy, a society, a change in culture, in the way we relate with nature. So it's very deep concepts that, that for, in order to, agree, to, to achieve those, those goals, carbon re reductions needs to happen. So, um, and, and that can only be achieved through a, a lower dependency on fossil fuels. If you say that we will um, reduce, suck up the air and filter that and reduce the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, that can give you open the door for a, sort of a, uh, an option where you have more time to continue burning fossil fuels. And that's, that's against the very nature of what we're talking about. So, so I think that that is something that we need to keep in mind uh, when, when we discuss this. Um, and so, so this is where the idea of, um, of CDR technologies can, can come into place and, 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 and from that frame, you can address things like overshooting, for example, when, when you say, you know, we are in, the, in an ambitious pathway but we have hit some overshooting in the in the in the trajectory of the re emissions reductions, and, and we might need to um, to use some technologies in order to adjust a little bit that 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 overshooting. Not because we don't want to reduce those, those emissions, because there is a clear commitment to do it, but because um, using those technologies can help us reduce further those emissions. So I think that that is is, is an important concept not always easy to, to, to explain or to understand, and, and, but central to this, to this discussion. The same thing will ha would happen with the, this idea that it is already in the IPCC reports that in the second half of the century, we should be not only net zero, but also negative in, in emissions. So s some of those, when, when we get to the very, very lower end of, of our emissions and maybe the abatement costs are very high. At that time, th there could be a possibility of, you know, considering uh, uh, re reductions that would necessarily go through CDR uh, and, and artificially, so to speak, artificially removing CO2 from the atmosphere. But having said that, I think it's it's also important that, to say that at the level of of knowledge that we have right now, and the IPCC is is uh, and Telma would put with surely will 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 can explain this better than my than myself but uh, the ipcc has been clearly uh considering some options outside of the net redu reduction of of emissions but concentrating in in nature based solutions and afforestation and 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 bioenergy with the carbon capture storage so things that 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 use the natural cycle of carbon in order to to to, to uh, remove uh, CO2 from the atmosphere, so what I'm trying to say is that that those technologies that are more in the in the in the in, in the forefront of, of of innovation are still somehow in the fringes of the of the analysis, and this is basically due to a, a, a issue of of uh, scales of impl of uh, of uh, deployment of those technologies, uh, but but also about the safety of those technologies. And I think that this is also something very important to keep in mind. Um, 
I'm 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 conscious that maybe I haven't really gone into this the nature of the question, <laughs> which is about the, the the process itself. And I think the the, the UNF triple C process has not been very active in looking for answers in the, the technologies that we are talking about. Um, basically, because NDCs are about emission reductions and and you know and and addressing deforestation and stuff like that. So, so it's is the more traditional way of thinking these these things, um, and uh, there are some. There's been some discussion about about CDR in in, in market discussion, as Paul can probably also be a witness of, uh, and, and 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 say something about that probably. Uh, but the, the, there might be a need also to 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 think about the use of these technologies in the context of the transparency framework. So how we can actually report on that, something that can be acceptable to everybody that, that, that is a contribution and not something that will raise eyebrows and say, well, maybe you are achieving something, but at the same time where maybe you are creating some problems for, for other, other, other countries. Um, there are many elements I, and I know that I'm going over time. So I, I'll, I'll leave it there and uh, hope that's uh, useful as an introduction. Thank you, Julio. And, and there was one thing that you mentioned that I'd like to come back later in the discussion when we look at the governance gaps themselves. But you mentioned the importance of uh, making sure that emission reductions will not be hurt by carbon dioxide removal activities. So the question of what one does in terms of the governance framework to make sure that it doesn't happen. So something to come back to. But can I now turn to uh, Paul? And I'd like to ask you, uh, from your perspective, uh, what are the key priority governance gaps and why those are the key ones and the priority ones. So over to you. Paul, I think we, you're frozen. Okay. Well, I'm happy yeah. to. You're there. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think there's a, there might be some connection issues. I hope it's working okay. I, working okay. I'll turn off my screen. I'll turn, turn off my image for a moment if it key carries on, but I'll try to keep going. I think it's. I think it solves itself. Uh, yes, I, I may not get too much into the detailed priorities because I think those will come out maybe more as we we discuss. But I want to raise a, a few areas, and I think it builds quite well on what you said, Janosch, in your first comments, and in particular what Julio has has just said, because um, it seems to me the areas we really need to get to grips with in talking about carbon dioxide removal at large scale is firstly when and how it is uh, really acceptable and necessary. We already have many areas where we, we work on uh, absorptions in the sinks area. Uh, Thelma talked about having worked in the forest area for many years in our discussions. Uh, we've talked about this a lot in the past. There are things we traditionally do that are part of the areas we, we know about and have worked on. Uh, but we're talking about moving to much greater scale even if we're using those activities moving into large scale of forestation, uh, BECs, uh, other fields, we're moving into different scales of the use of uh, these te techniques or technologies. Um, so that is a first part, which I think we need to be conscious of. Uh, and, and I think linked to that, and in particular, picking up on the issue about the reducing emissions as being uh, absolutely essential. This is not an alternative to bringing our emissions down to zero or as close to zero as we can get. It's about how we complete that, particularly in some areas, and then help us move into uh, negative take emissions in, in where, where and when we will need it. Uh, so we really can keep two degrees or, or one and a half degrees as a possibility. Um, and I think for a long time, particularly the Kyoto model, we thought that you know, a ton is a ton. It doesn't matter where it comes from, what sector it comes from. Uh, if we reduce it, it's okay. Whereas clear, we have to bring everything down. There are some which will be harder than others. And we will all face trouble in particular sectors, particular regions, uh, and over a certain time. And there's a big debate on the just transition. We'll have to manage. How do we deal with that? We can't bring everything down in one go even the, the, the pandemic this year hasn't done that, although it has affected our emissions. So the way in which we manage that raises some, some, some big issues about the timing and the scale of that. And I think Julio mentioned overshooting, and I think it raises a number of issues about temporal equity. Uh, when do we act and what's the speed and what's the interaction between reducing emissions and starting to use 
large-scale carbon dioxide uh, reductions? How do those fit together? And I think there's some serious equity issues around there. And I'd raise another equity issue, which is, again, if I look at this, this sort of Kyoto-type model, you can trade, you can offset from different places. We've all got to come down uh, to zero or close to zero in our emissions and to build those uh, absorptions and those negative emissions over time. Uh, but we won't all have the same um, possibility or capacity to do that. Uh, how does that get worked out? If in long-term strategies, some think, well, I'm going to get loads of negative emissions and absorptions from somewhere else, how do we talk about that side? Uh, and there are big geographical equity issues when we really get to large scale use, how does that play through? So I think there are a whole series of issues there. I'll be very brief on two other points and then I'll, uh, I'll wrap up my first comments. The second, and Julio has already mentioned it, is where we have rules under the, uh, the Climate Convention and the Paris Agreement. And I know C2G has done some work on it. I think Bill was contributing in one of the papers I saw, as I recall. Uh, I know the tracking, credibility, verification, those matter a huge amount. If we're doing this, it can't just be, oh, I've captured lots of CO2 or I've used lots of CO2. We need to know what's happened to it, the permanence of it and where it's being tracked and we're following it. That verification matters. Um, I won't get into markets and, uh, and the links to Article 6 uh, in detail, but clearly that comes back to my point about the geographical uh, side as well. How is that credible? I'm not sure the discussions we've had so far are fit for purpose for large scale use in this form. And I think we need a separate one. And just to finish, there are, of course, a large number of interactions with other fields. Julio mentioned nature-based solutions, which I think are extremely interesting. But there is a lot of issues about the interaction with biodiversity. Uh, there can be win-win solutions there. There can be trade-offs. Uh, and they can also link into food security, into questions of human rights, uh, particularly for local communities, indigenous peoples, and others. Those are very complicated issues we cannot solve under only under the climate convention or the Paris Agreement. So there are, there are many areas which go beyond our scope and which we'll have to think about the linkages there. Thank you, Paul. And, and, and uh, lots of very interesting issues here. Maybe later in the discussion, if, if you have the possibility to say a few more words about what you mean by the temporal equity and equity, I found that interesting, but maybe it needs a, a few sentences just to clear. Uh, what, what it is, but, but later. Uh, and now maybe I'll ask, uh, I'd like to come to you, Bill, and essentially ask the same question as from Paul, uh, what are the key priority governance uh, gaps from your perspective and why? And maybe it's the same list, maybe it's a different list, uh, or maybe the reasoning is different, but I look forward to hearing from you. Yeah, thanks, Janos. Yeah, great. Look, um, I, I've got, I guess, first to frame um, the governance challenges, um, as Paul alluded to, we've had done some work on this. And so we have identified um, the governance challenges in this area has been framed by four big issues. Um, I think uh, Julia has already mentioned that, for example, the scale and speed of mitigation. Um, and then another qu big question is, what about the incentives for scaling up CDR? Second framing issue is the trade-offs and interactions with, uh, for example, food security, water biodiversity, which has also been mentioned, and some of the climate system risks. And these, these four key issues, as we see it, then frame what we had seen were about nine uh, governance challenges. I can't go through nine, of course, now, but uh, some of the most important ones uh, would include the uh, responsibility already mentioned um, of who has to uh, undertake CDR activities and implementation of these. Another governance challenge is a little bit more mundane but really fundamental is how do we develop systems to monitor the progress uh, we're making towards uh, uh, getting towards uh, negative emissions towards removals. Um, at present, we don't have a good system for doing that. How do we, third um, point might be the systems needed to measure, report and verify CO2 removals. Um, we don't really have those systems yet, nor do we have the legal architecture for that. Fourthly, uh, as has been mentioned, a number of the 
the scale of the CDR measures also poses challenges for sustainable development trade-offs. How do we build that into the governance of CDR to ensure that we don't uh, overdo it on carbon plantations, subtracting damaging biodiversity, water or food, for example? A fifth element um, of concern is how do we make sure that uh, these CDR measures are durable, that is permanent? How do we manage issues of long-term storage and ultimate saturation of, of uh, storage options, including in the biosphere and so-called nature-based solutions? So these are five out of about nine uh, key governance issues, um, and they relate differently to different measures. So some of these issues um, relate quite strongly to nature-based solutions. Others uh, are more strongly interact with more technological approaches such as direct air capture. Looking at nature-based solutions, for example, some of the governance challenges there really very importantly relate to how to uh, ensure that um, the kind of measures being proposed or introduced don't uh, damage biodiversity, food or water security. And on the mitigation side, how do we make sure that the application of nature-based solutions don't or are not simply allowed, uh, used to allow an increase or maintenance of emissions from the energy system that would otherwise have been reduced uh, in the absence of those nature-based uh, approaches? Critical issues, for example, on um, finally on say technological means of of removing CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, so, some of these relate to the biodiversity, the safeguards for sustainable development, but others relate to the question of how do we provide incentives for the rollout of these technologies. Yes, we have to be achieving uh, likely negative emissions by uh, shortly after mid-century, but to actually be in that position. Uh, we would need to have begun to roll out these technologies decades sooner. And at present, we don't have the incentives or approaches that really encourage that to happen uh, at scale. So I think that's another key governance issue that we need to look at um, in moving forward. So, yeah, and I'll speak to you. That's just a bit of an introduction to some of the perspectives that I have on this. Thank you, Bill. Very, very helpful and, and lots of lots of interesting points and also to look at how some of these relate more to the nature based type approaches and others relate more to some of the other ones. So that's also an interesting help. Uh, I'd like to now turn to Stefan and again, ask the same question from your perspective. How do you see the key uh, governance gaps and why? Yeah, thanks, Janos. Um, <clears throat> I have heard many very interesting points and um, I wouldn't call them conclusions, uh, but fuel for sorts, which I think will be shared or are shared by many in the NGO and CSO community in a constructive way. Not that we have any solutions to that one, um, but I think we all learn while we walk. <clears throat> First, let me, let me um, <clears throat> raise one issue. And I think Julio mentioned that one initially and I, in case it was you, Julio, and then, 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 then I share that one strongly. Um, we know from science and from the IPCC um, that net zero targets are just an intermediary target. Uh, we need to go to net negative emissions eventually. Uh, we're currently at about 412 ppm CO2 in the atmosphere, um, which is probably 5 million years record of CO2 um, emissions and um, in the Pliocene that was leading to two to four meter sea level rise and two to four degree warmer temperatures globally. So we are, we are, we are lagging behind. Huh? CO2 concentrations are much faster than nature can react um, because we know all the lag time in, in the natural ecosystems. So we need to reduce concentrations significantly. I think that's a debate we have not had. And I see the self-critical as NGOs um, I think the scientists do that one, but we as NGOs are a little bit reluctant to do that one um, for whatever reasons. And I, I think it would be useful that, that we need to do that one as NGOs because that's ultimately the way of protecting or limiting damage, I should say, to um, vulnerable ecosystems, to um, exposed communities and to the physical, the physical landscape 
of our Earth because runaway climate change will mean a couple of meters sea level rise eventually in the next couple of hundred years, which will destroy um, many livelihoods and many communities which are built up close to the sea and on islands. So we need to have that debate. Um, I think the second point for me is it has been said the, um, the, 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 the mantra is the ultimate paradigm is to bring emissions down. That's a key issue. Now reduce emissions at source drastically, radically, all sources, all sectors everywhere and with significant funding for poor developing countries. So the equity the dimension should not be underestimated. It's fundamentally important that we need to have in the rich countries a significant amount of um, to pay for the poorer countries to do mitigation and I should not ignore adaptation as well because there will be unavoidable unavoidable impacts and even a 1.5 degree world is not a paradise you should be honest about this one because we see already was one degrees significant impacts um i think that's very important politically um then the third point for me would be um and that goes to the governance issue janos to some extent which cdr options we would we would suggest. Um, I think we need to be aware of that certain CDR options have impacts in one way or the other, some more, others less, on on issues beyond climate change. People have talked about this eco, uh, food security, um, ecosystem protection, biodiversity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, that needs a sober analysis, and I think it's unavoidable that there might be eventually some trade-offs. I don't think we have the luxury anymore to only have win-win-win-win solutions. I think we need to make dire choices. Not that we make them, but I think governments who are responsible in the end have to make them, but they should be well advised um, that um, we use the, um, the least damaging solutions because we have lost 30, 40 years. I think that's the, that's the consequence of, of what we know. So there are trade-offs. Um, the first point is more practical on the um, issues on, on CDR. What is what is our requirements on liability of long-term permanence, both geological storage, such as from the technical solution like DEX, mineral weathering, or or BEX, and 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 what do we require from from nature-based solutions? Of course, we as NGOs would favor nature-based solutions because they have so many other benefits, um, but they have also downturns. There might be there might be limits to it. There might be saturation effects, and we have seen forests going up in flames in the last two years in Australia, in Siberia, and not the least in California. So I think no one knows at this point in time what is the um, long-term permanence in forests and ecosystems um, when they are confronted with climate change impacts. Um, that doesn't mean we should not protect forests. Get me really right here. That's not my point. But in terms of carbon emissions reductions, negative emissions, we might think about having a large scale deployment scheme um, in terms of research and development on issues, on, on, on technologies, which are not linked to nature-based solutions. Whether it's tax, whether it's mineral weathering, I, I wouldn't be able to give you the the, um, the the recipe here. But I think we need we need to jump we need to jump the boat um, and have a large research scale assessment analysis because we need to reduce concentrations and not only emissions. I think we need to be honest to ourselves on that one. How we do that? Where we do that? Um, what are the equity requirements? Which countries are doing that first bill? I think you're fully right on that one. It's a different debate. It's not a, it's, it's, the issue is not whether we do it. The issue is how we do that one mm -hmm. and in the most equitable way. And the governance would require to find out some of the criteria um, and some of the preconditions based on equity. Where should that happen? Who should put the money forward? What would the technology be? Um, and how would that be transparently monitored and verified, including long-term liability of the storage? I stop here.
Thank you, thank you, Stefan. And that's that's really interesting. And this, what you said, leads us uh, very nicely to the last question I like to pose now. This time to Telma. Uh, Telma, you've been part of many of these intergovernmental processes that are addressing these issues, either from a scientific or negotiation perspective. And you heard a number of the colleagues around this uh, campfire talked about the linkage to other issues. Uh, uh, trade-off synergies. So I guess my question to you is, who? what are the existing processes that are looking at the governance uh, or should be looking at the governance of these issues? And and, and if you could answer these, uh, this question in a way that you already look at connections uh, beyond the climate world, to, to, because that's what we were talking about, biodiversity, food security, things like that. Okay, so please. Okay, thanks, Janos. And uh, okay, let me also say uh, a couple of things here before I start. Uh, obviously, uh, I will try to convey as much as possible what comes from the assessments of the IPCC. So I want to be even faithful to the language that the IPCC uses. And then, if you allow me, I will change my hat. And since this is informal, I will bring some of my own uh, personal considerations on some issues. So I will you're make it- You're welcome to use as many hats as you like. <laughs> okay, so, so to make it absolutely clear that some of these might come from my own uh, perspectives. So from the, from the IPCC point of view, Janos, uh, it's recognized that uh, there are very scarce governance mechanisms you know, uh, today. And uh, basically they are either, either targeted to some specific CDR options like you know ocean-based uh, CDR uh, or, or aspects of the CDR, for instance, the indirect land use change to, related to bioenergy upscaling, and we know that the only international uh, governance mechanism in place is the research and uh, development uh, of ocean uh, fertiliz fertilization within the Convention on Biological Diversity. So, uh, so when we are talking about governance, and there are so many aspects of governance, some of them uh, go into the international needs to be, you know, uh, handled uh, internationally under an international governance, as it was done under, you know, as as I mentioned on ocean fertilization, but others also need to be done and carried out at national level. And uh, I would also like to highlight uh, the, 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 the definition of governance that IPCC applies, which is the most inclusive you know, uh, definition that relates not only uh, to the federal government, but also to all levels of governance, uh, the civil society, the private sector. We talk about the indigenous peoples every time more and more the local communities as have already been highlighted because most of these options will uh, in a certain way impact the lives of people. And I will come to that aspect of governance later on, which I don't think have been explored too much from the previous speakers. So uh, some, of, uh, some of these options that we have for the CDR are really in a very early stage of uh, development and few demonstrations. And uh, obviously coupled with the considerable, considerable ch challenge to deploy this uh, at scale. And the scale, speed and scale have been really highlighted by, you know, basically everybody. But all, also most of the CDR options uh, face multiple feasibility constraints. And th this limits the potential for any single option to sustainably achieve the large scale deployment required to the 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius consistent pathways. So the speed and scales required for limiting the warming to the 1.5 as the, you know, the, the special report of the IPCC says, pose a considerable implementation challenge. And, uh, and uh, actually present there is this dissonance between the large CO2 removers needed for the 1.5 pathways and the long time periods involved in scaling up these novel technologies. 
I would like uh, to finalize this participation of mine as IPCC, bringing these considerations from the IPCC, uh, mentioning uh, two issues. Uh, you know that in, in, in every chapter of the IPCC and the IPCC basically, you know, uh, 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 what it does is the assessment of the literature worldwide. So it doesn't do research on its own. So we do still lack some, uh, some uh, literature uh, to really uh, provide some support on every aspect. I would say that one of, uh, of the issues uh, that are important that I would say really there is a lack on governance is on the governance of research. And the IPCC raises the, the issue of knowledge gaps around implementing and strengthening the global response to climate change. And, uh, and that, that would to be urgently uh, resolved if a transition to the 1.5 uh, world is to become a reality. And it singles out two issues that I'm gonna raise and I'm gonna bring the specific language that IPCC uses in terms of these knowledge gaps. And one of them refers to the life cycle emissions and the prospects for early stage CDR options. So looking at the whole thing, not only to the aspect related to the implementation or deployment, but to the life cycle implications in terms of emissions. And another gap that is related to governance uh, is also important. And it's mentioned in the 1.5 special report uh, that refers to how can different actors and processes in climate governance reinforce each other and hedge against the fragmentation of initiatives. <laughs> So this is the actual language that IPCC uses in the 1.5 uh, special report. So now I turn my head and, uh, and I think I feel more comfortable because we are on an informal setting. But I think that the IPCC does bring this very important element of uh, knowledge gaps. And more than that, I would say uh, the need for this governance of research, Janos. Governance of research is one of the issues that I think, if we look at the literature around all the CDR, and if we look at the mitigation potentials or the potentials of the CDRs, we see that the broad range of these potentials. And in where are these potentials? And how can these options be implemented in different regions of the world uh, without having the minimum social impact possible, if any, right? So all these discussions of not only looking globally, what is the potential of the CDR options, but you know, looking at where are these potentials and uh, what are the different social economic impacts, I would say. And as, as you mentioned, to, to, to also go beyond we do see a lot of relation between these things also and the, and the, the sustainable development goals. We can say that some of these uh, could have synergies uh, and trade-offs as has already been, been mentioned, right? So uh, I would also say that one aspect that I don't think has been explored so far, and I think that is also key for governance relates to public awareness. Not only, you know, uh, because you have so many options, so many different options. Some of these, we are acquainted. We are very acquainted with afforestation and reforestation. We are acquainted with bioenergy, not so much with bioenergy, with carbon capture and storage, right? And where this is gonna be storage. And we have already, identified the liability issues related to the permanence, which it seems not to be, uh, if the sites are, you know, are chosen carefully, uh, that would not be so, uh, such a, uh, so much of an issue. You could say that the permanence there would be for many, many, many years, uh, thousands of years maybe. 
But uh, uh, myself, uh, I am more concerned with the permanence of uh, afforestation and reforestation. <laughs> because that, then, then we are not talking about a thousand years. We are talking about a much shorter time uh, period for the permanence fishery. And more than that, it's not only the permanence in good conditions, but the permanence that have already been uh, flagged under the climate change and under uh, and then under the conditions of droughts that are driving also the fires. So you're having now uh, extreme events that put at stake some of these options, not only for afforestation and reforestation, but Julia also mentioned the nature-based uh, uh, solutions, which I, I'm gonna say that strongly, I would prefer to be called uh, nature-based options not necessarily solutions. So as to convey that you may not have a solution there, but uh, in some cases it might even uh, make things worse, right? Uh, because suppose we do this very, very, afforestation and reforestation is also under the nature-based solutions. Some of them it's really important because you can make it the recovery of, recovery, uh, recovery of degraded lands, recovery of the mangroves, which not only address the mitigation or the removal, but also most importantly, maybe some of these options would be very much linked to, a, to, uh, to adaptation. You know, bringing the two together would be the ideal world, right? So in some uh, coastal zones, some of these options, nature-based options, could also bring uh, uh, an important contribution uh, to, to uh, adaptation. But I would say that, uh, you know, uh, this is why, and coming back to the IPCC says, maybe a portfolio of options would be the best of the world, because then, then you would uh, uh, most likely avoid this large scale implementation for which, even under the afforestation and afforestation that we so much know, but also bioenergy that we also know, we have lots of experiences worldwide. But what is a little bit frightening in terms of knowledge is what would be the impact of large scale implementation of these options. And that's where I think there is still a lack, a lack of the scientific knowledge of this. And obviously the large scale, uh, especially for afforestation, reforestation and backs. And why do I mention these? Because most of the 1.5 pathways that IPCC explored in the special report relied on these two uh, options, right? Uh, so this is why there is more uh, knowledge into that in the, in, in the IPCC, including uh, on the potential competition for food security. Are we competing with food? Are we competing with the production of energy, bioenergy, uh, or uh, energy at large? What kind of uh, feedstocks are we using? So all these uh, require different levels of governance. You have to finance also some of uh, these technologies, which are still not, you know, at the level of uh, potentially being deployed in the next coming years. So incentives for that, so that you could have a portfolio that would most likely reduce the potential impacts. So, uh, so I just to finalize would reinforce this need for, you know, the governance of research, because this would allow uh, a broader participation of countries that could be potentially more affected. They could contribute a lot for the uh, implementation and deployment, but they could also have uh, uh, other impacts that need to be known. And uh, so uh, that would be my initial uh, reaction to your question. Thank you, Thelma. And, and uh, uh, before continuing, I just would like to, to remind our participants to put their questions uh, forward. Uh, we're running a little bit behind time, but we'll find a way to, to, to address some of the questions. So please go ahead. Uh, now, uh, colleagues, uh, uh, are there any of you who would like to ask a follow-up question from each other? I've noted a few things that I, I would like to follow up on, but first, uh, if there is anybody who would like to 
to sort of follow up or ask a question from each other, uh, this is a good moment. So I see Stefan's hand, so let's do that. Go ahead, Stefan, and then Bill. Yeah, thank you, I'll keep it short. Telma, I'm, I'm going back to you. Um, I think, I think, um, I mean, uh, sorry to say, I think you make the same mistake that the IPCC has done in the past and many other scientists have, have been doing. We talk about afforestation, reforestation, and backs. We do not talk about restoration, which is a different category. And I think we need to include that one. Reforestation, afforestation tend to be um, industrial planted activities as useful as they might be, right? But they are not necessarily linked to issues of addressing a multiple and plethora of other benefits. So restoration for ecosystems of ecosystems. And I agree with you um, that this is linked, that has many links to adaptation as well, um, are fundamentally important. But let's talk increasingly about restoration as well, in addition to protection of ecosystems as a way forward, as the key solutions. If we talk about nature-based solutions, or you say nature-based options, I don't care, form follows function. Um, but restoration is very, very important, I think, and not just re and afforestation, right? Um, that will that will be my point to you in 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 that context, and I think that has not been had not been um, explored. The second thing is, in the context of of um, of um, forestry, um, the the duration of um, forest harvesting cycles is very very important. We know from science. That if you harvest what we do in Europe and in North America, I don't know about Brazil, but it might be similar. If you harvest forests, management, uh, managed forests, after 80 years, 90 years already, you deprive the potential forest carbon sequestration significant. If you prolong the forest cycle, the forest harvesting cycle, to 100 years and longer, then you can harvest much more carbon and you will store also much more carbon. So I think there are issues in there um, which are not just addressed with the simple scheme of re and afforestation, um, but need to look into the sustainable management of ecosystems in case they are managed. And we need to look into leaving certain ecosystems alone, protected and alone. Um, as best as possible, I do not know, but I think that's very, very important. Thank you. Bill, yeah. uh, unless you're just a second, Bill, if, if this uh, yeah, is your question related to this or it's something else. Okay. Your mic, please keep your mic on. It's not exactly what it is. What, okay, um, then, then tell me, go ahead, please. Yeah, I'm going to try to be very concise. So, uh, Stephen, thank you very for the two issues. So on the first one on the restoration, I think that the IPCC does include that it depends uh, it depends uh, uh, where you read. When I am reading the uh, uh, AR5, I do see a broader range in the chapter that addresses agriculture, forestry, and other land uses, where you see uh, the restoration as uh, included, not necessarily as ACDR, but I would say that uh, all the options that you have that remove CO2 from the atmosphere would be uh, an option that would be viable. The next issue is a little bit more complex for me. And I agree with you that duration of the, of the harvesting cycle is an important. Uh, but you mentioned that to the removal of CO2. And I would say that that removal will work if you have not reached the, the saturation level, right? So, so the saturation level uh, that would then uh, be very little a removal of CO2 from the, from the plantation. So this would be my, uh, my, my, uh, my, my comment uh, on this, but to be short, to be short. But I, uh, I agree with you that restoration. We talk also about sequestration of, uh, by the soils. We do a lot for that. That potentially is one of the options that uh, would be uh, ready to be implemented, but it is hard because soils are a little bit slow to uh, react, you know, to to the to the changes in practices. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Tamara. Bill, over to you. Yeah, I'm, we've been discussing quite a lot of about 
general principles and issues. And, and as a scientist, I always like to find examples to talk about and ask questions about. So here's one. Uh, a few days ago, uh, the French company Total uh, shipped a shipment of LNG from Northern Australia to China and put out a, a big press release saying it was carbon neutral. Um, and the carbon neutrality came uh, in part through uh, forest protection uh, in, a, in Zimbabwe. Now, when you looked into those, that example a bit, you found that immediately all these questions that I've just been raising, we've been talking about, uh, 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 exploded into reality, right? Because there's no verifiable system except one run, run by the private sector to guarantee that these uh, emission uh, neutrality is uh, based on real and additional, uh, uh, for example, sequestration or uh, um, negative emissions, if you like. Um, there's no ultimate test of this uh, that is multilaterally assessed and organized. And prima facie, I would say that um, this does not look like at all it is carbon neutral, but it is one of a new set of claims that we are beginning to see emerge from industry that they are becoming carbon neutral by offsetting their industrial emissions, their CO2 emissions, without actually reducing emissions through uh, carbon sequestration measures. So this is one of the, it's an old issue, but it's coming up again now. Um, and it does relate very fundamentally to the kind of governance issues that we're talking about. And it adds a sense of kind of urgency to get on and, and look at these. And I'm wondering what other colleagues here really think about this whether this is a viable way forward for companies to launch into the carbon neutral space themselves and thereby set um, uh, rules de facto, or whether there, there is a role for governance, governments and the multilateral process to do that first. It's a, it's a very interesting question, Bill. And, and I think you yourself and many of the other colleagues around the campfire raised the issue of uh, how do you measure, how do you report, how do you verify, how do you compare? Exactly. So these exactly. issues are yeah. clearly there. So and any any quick reactions from colleagues? And then I would like to go to the floor because we have some questions coming in. So um, any any quick reactions uh, to, to Bill? Although or we all agree that this is an issue and we need to, to uh, yeah, Paul, why don't you have a first go at that? <clears throat> I, I won't comment on the specific example because I, I don't know the details of it, but I think it, it builds raising an interesting point about how the uh, the use of some of this, di this this discourse is going to be taken up. Some of it is is primarily communication, uh, and I think this this example that you've just quoted, Bill, sounds very much like it's it's communication by a company to express itself. Uh, I mean, this is obviously something we're going to live with as we move forward. It's not new. Uh, we've had companies doing this in the past. Uh, how far and how does this go? But I think it's also how far we've really started to develop a, a common understanding of what the, these challenges really mean uh, at a government level, at a wider civil society level. And I think our discussion so far shows that's something we haven't gone far enough with. Uh, and to give real expression to that. Uh, then we can start to look at how do our specific rules at a national level pick up uh, the use of communication by companies, particularly multinational companies who often fall outside uh, national uh, governance in terms of their communication. Uh, if this is used in an internal debate, um, say it's used in a carbon market where a company has a specific target, then we can impose very clear rules on the credibility of what the offsets are. If it's used purely for communication outside, it's harder. Um, so I think it's, it's taking us into new areas and we'll have to think through, particularly as we move to this real uh, neutrality and then net negative uh, emissions, how does that fit in? I, I think it's an interesting contribution. Okay, um, thank you, Paul, that's, that's, that's helpful. Um, unless there are other, yes, uh, Julio, go ahead, please. Yes, thank you. So, you know, I, I think this, this, is, this is very interesting and, and really touches upon one very central topic, which is the participation of the, of the private sector and how, how we can make sure that that is in line with what we expect from, 
from something that is real, measurable, and and transparent. Um, and for, for for many of for many of us in the in, in this panel, we have seen that the uh, that there have been proposals in the past in the unf c process to see how we can actually uh, have uh, some coherence and, and, and integration between between the way countries report, governments report on their on their targets, at the same time giving clear um, indications and frameworks for the private sector to say what is what is what, what is a meaningful reduction, what is permanent, and 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 how 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 uh, the private sector can actually contribute from their own operations. Uh, uh, and, 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 and I think we, we need to be honest to, to ourselves and say that we haven't been successful in that discussion. Uh, and, and that is, that is, a, quite, that is a problem because, because behind the example that, that, that has been uh, presented, uh, I think there is also um, the reality that, that the private sector is increasingly interested in being part of the solution. And, and if we are not, if you're not able to, to, to make a distinction between things that are simply for communication purposes instead of uh, real solutions and real contributions that aim at, at what uh, governments are being committed to, um, I think we're in, we are in, a, in a situation that, that we are not you know, providing the, the, the tools and, and, and the spaces to, to channel that, that interest that is coming from, from the private sector that is also transitioning to, to a low carbon um, uh, cycle. So, I think that that's also a missing piece of the of the puzzle that 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 we also need to think about. Mm -hmm. Can I can I just have a very short intervention sure. on that one, Jonas? Yes, yes, quite. Julio, I think I think we should not make. I understand where you're coming from, and and I not. I'm I'm in line with um, having the role of the private sector understood and working with them as a fundamental implementation agency or sector to help us to achieve what we want. But the private sector is not monolithic. I mean, I'm in this in the advisory committee of the um, Science Based Target Initiative, which has 1050 companies now. They are so diverse. Um, it's not monolithic. They're all different interests. And it would be a big mistake to believe that those who are the loudest and who are the biggest polluters would determine what is the corporate sector interest in that one. Mm -hmm. I think those who are the loudest and the biggest are also the biggest polluter. And those are those who are responsible that the other companies feel some responsibility to take action. There's a huge difference between Westas, a windmill producer, and BP or Shell. There's a big, dif big, big, big difference between Exxon or Gazprom, who want to go carbon neutral as well, and the major medium-sized company which wants to purchase 100% renewables. We need to acknowledge that one. And I think we need to be very sure that we do not allow, and US governments it do not allow for cheating and for greenwashing. Let's work with those companies which are really and truly wanting to reduce emissions as much as possible and not those who go for cheating. Uh, with land use emissions, as important that is to, in, to, 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 to invest into protecting forests and go for restoration. I'm not denying that one. But whether we do that via credits and, and let them off the hook by emitting more CO2 it's a completely different thing. We need to be very honest to ourselves that we do not cheat the atmosphere. Okay. Thank you, Stefan. And oh, Julio, come back quickly. Oh, yeah, I, no, we go ahead, yes. And then I, then I want to go to the yes. questions. It's just that, 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 that I think it's, it's an interesting conversation. And, and I couldn't agree more. I mean, the, 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 the question I was trying to say, to, or the, the issue that I was trying to explain is precisely that we don't have, um, a, a, a common understanding of how we, we as governments can, be, can, be, can avoid being cheated by, by these efforts from the private sector. And sometimes the private sector is demanding from, from guidance to say, you know, what, I'm really committed and, 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 and I really want to contribute to this. But how can I make sure that the efforts that I'm putting in place are, are going to be recognized as, as such? What are the standards that, that, that I need to comply with in order to do that? And I fully agree. We need to avoid, uh, you know, we need to avoid, uh, you know, ignoring those those imbalances be, uh, within the private sector. But this is precisely something that 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 might be need to dis be discussed with all the, its complexities. Uh, and, and you know, in the in the in the in the UFC process, there's been a lot of discussion about conflict of interest and and that. 
and we shouldn't avoid that discussion either. But there is a there, there is a vacuum there, and and, and 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 I think if we want to take the best of, of those contributions, we, we we might need to have some governance discussion also um, in, in in trying to define and, and sort of separate what is what is communi computer communication to, to what is actually a, a, a real and honest uh, contribution. Thank you. Uh, I, it, it's, it's very interesting, uh, Bill, you, the, the, the issue you put on, on the table here uh, is to be about something concrete. In this case, it was about a, a total uh, suggesting that something was or wasn't uh, uh, climate neutral. Uh, one of our participants sent up a, an anonymous note here saying that this, at the same time, Total wants to build an oil pipeline from Uganda across to Tanzania. Uh, how can they even mention the world climate friendly and carbon neutral? I leave it at that, just just uh, just just to, to not complete that picture, but to make that picture uh, richer. But I want to come back to one question that uh, Dorian Stabinsky asked, um, which I think is quite interesting, and it relates to a number of points that have been raised by by you. And, and I, I'd like you to, to address that. So uh, earlier, we talked a little bit about the relationship between emission reductions and carbon removal. The more we reduce now, the less carbon we will have to remove. Uh, it's not clear how much this is known. And at the same time, I think Doreen is saying that how can we keep focus of governments and corporate actors focused on emission reductions? Uh, what governance frameworks do we need or governance actions do we need to make sure that that happens? Because uh, she's saying that the net zero initiatives enable loss of that focus. And then it obscures the magnitude of CDR uh, that is being assumed in net zero and eventually, of course, let's not forget about net negative uh, pledges. So we need clarity and how do we achieve that? And there was also mentioned in your, your various earlier points about uh, participation of the broader group of stakeholders. And I haven't heard much uh, about how to address the, the idea of developing uh, uh, societal discussions and societal uh, participation in uh, making choices about these different approaches. And I uh, tell them I do use approaches uh, also not just for nature-based, but for other. <laughs> quote unquote solutions as well. So <laughs> anyway, but I, I think Doreen's question about the focus on emission reductions, how do we, what governance actions, frameworks do we need to, to, to keep that going? So please, any, any reactions from uh, any of you? Well, I think isn't that in the short run, a lot about how national governments uh, design their instruments to achieve emission reductions. So. If national governments um, have a regulatory framework that allows the kind of offsetting that I just mentioned, then the net zero issue um, becomes exactly as Doreen has described, that it becomes a system for licensing ongoing uh, emissions of greenhouse gases. But if the frameworks are designed that don't allow for that, um, then you create the incentives not to do it. Um, I mean, the, the EU trading system, for all its um, you know, complexities, in general, doesn't allow this kind of offsetting to occur within that system. Um, other governments have approaches that are much more laissez-faire, if I may put it that way, and uh, certainly Australia is one of those. Um, so I think it really comes down to um, Governments getting clear what the purpose of climate policy and climate action is. If it's if it's to really reduce emissions, then they need to construct the instruments to do that. And on the other side of it, to deal with the other side of the equation, need to look at how to introduce policies and incentives for uh, industry to begin investing in the CDR approaches um, and to de-risk some of those and to look at and explore the sustainability trade-offs involved. There's, I mean, there, there is a growing um, bit of re, you know, research programs in the European Union, for example, through the Horizon 2020 or German Research Ministry, for example, now and other places, which is, 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 um, is significant, but not enough. 
And I, I think that other countries need to look at that as well, because a lot of these issues are very country specific, as I think Thelma alluded to in a different way. Where is the CO2 going to be stored? What are the options? Well, they, they're different in each country and there are going to be different sustainability trade-offs. And if you go back to those general governance points I was talking about, I talked to five of nine, then you can locate these issues within those within that framework for, uh, for governments to look at. Um, and I, I think that's just something to really reflect on. As for the public um, awareness and acceptance, I, I think that that is also a good question. And somehow there hasn't been enough debate um, about this, or if there is a debate, it's very polarized. Um, so I think one also needs to, to reflect on ways to have, have public discussions about these issues that aren't as polarized as they've been in, in some contexts. Thank you, Bill. I think, Paul, you would like to also respond to this. Yeah, um, quite quickly. I, I think there is another framework we need to bring into here. Uh, which is the work that governments are doing in developing uh, long-term strategies uh, uh, to get to sort of decarbonize totally our economies and, and think through uh, the way forward, at least to the middle of the century is the, the main time frame most of us have been working on. Um, as I said at the start, I'm not speaking on, on behalf of uh, the French government here, but there is a, you know, in France, a national uh, low, low carbon uh, strategy uh, taking us to, to, to net zero by 2050. That does include uh, some use of sequestration, uh, of course, strengthening that in the uh, land and, and forestry sector, but not in a, uh, in a broader sort of logic of, of trading. It's, it's not that sense, it's on our national territory. Um, but I mean, these are tools which can also be used to have part of this conversation. Uh, as we think through what is that transition we're taking forward, it becomes explicit what we are thinking about driving down emissions totally in the energy production or electricity production and wider energy sector. sector. It becomes explicit what we're thinking uh, about emissions in industry. It becomes explicit about what we're thinking in building uh, and other service areas of, of our economy. So these choices become much clearer when we put it in that framework. It's not a choice between a generic debate on uh, carbon dioxide reduction or, or, or not. It is what are the specific policy frameworks we are putting in place as governments. And I think this is where some of that debate must take place. And I think that is also an area we, we must probably go further uh, in involving the public. I mean, in France, again, we have just had um, the, the fascinating experience of having a citizens convention, uh, looking at our climate policies and making recommendations. There's now a, a slightly awkward debate about how far the government and then our parliament will take that up. And I, I don't want to comment in detail, that's ongoing. Um, but it's, it's these are places that we can find new methods, new approaches, so that people are engaged in exactly these sort of choices. And I think things like citizens conventions can be a way to bring that choice in into our national policy uh, making processes. Although it is not easy uh, to link that back in to the more traditional legislative processes. And, and we're trying to find a way forward on that in France at the moment, respecting what we got from our citizens uh, debating with uh, at a government level and with our parliamentarians. Okay, uh, I, can I just continue on the same line and, and maybe ask Thelma to, to say a few words here. Um, we've heard a lot, but for, for one thing, what, what both Bill and, and Paul you're saying is, is the need for a, an overarching climate response strategy and show the connections between these and then have that go through whatever public consultation interaction process uh, you, you have in your respective countries or regions. Now, within that, we've heard a couple of times uh, connections to incentivizing research, particularly in developing countries, Thelma, you, you have that. We also have uh, some question here about uh, 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 how can African governments be convinced <laughs> about some of these issues. So uh, I, I just want to, to, to focus a little bit on part of this picture on what we can, what you think would be uh, usefully done in whatever overall governance frameworks in order to incentivize uh, research uh, in developing countries and in order to 
engage developing countries, at least in consideration of these issues. It's not about pushing them to use this technology or not, or that approach or that, but it's the consideration thereof. And then uh, I would be, I would welcome other colleagues also to address that. Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Janos. Uh, you know, we, 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 what we know is that most countries do have their own research groups that are most of the time strong as well. But uh, the issue is how these things are scattered. And sometimes, you know, uh, a focus on a specific aspect or technology or, uh, a, a, as I said, some, some focus on something specific of interest to the country, but not an overall idea of of uh, of of the research and implications as i said you know i i very much uh, appreciate uh, public awareness as i already mentioned i think there is a need for people to understand why some things you know are being discussed uh, so i would say that there are several ways uh, we can stimulate a broader discussion on on, on research and bringing more research communities together. And, uh, and I think that this has to be outside the realm of the, for instance, of uh, UN uh, bodies, which might take a long time to do this or focus on a specific aspect. But you know, but you know, to, to have <clears throat> institutions that uh, would stimulate the discussions, which could start to be developed at a regional level, where I think uh, you know countries share common problems and issues, and then broaden up uh, to a uh, uh, to a more global global level of, of research. But I, I, I also would like Janos uh, uh, to say, um, you know, especially you know in developing countries, uh, and I now I'm going to use only. One thing that IPCC deems as a, as a very important uh, element for the implementation of mitigation, and I would say that uh, you know if we do ambitious mitigation, we would not need necessarily to to make use of uh, you know other options, including CDR. Despite although for the 1.5, some level of CDR will be necessary, but. Uh, so when we are talking about ambitious uh, mitigation and looking at this, how IPCC sees uh, international cooperation as one of the means by which, you know, uh, this could be stimulated in particular for developing countries. Uh, this could basically help a lot this transition, especially because the developing countries have potentially more uh, room or flexibility. And I'm talking uh, as myself here, uh, for uh, for changing or doing the transition to the uh, to a uh, to a, a carbon neutrality maybe or decarbonization you name it because they are still in the process of development. But what I see is a, 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 an impediment. First of, we uh, every time we see some financial incentive on the table for this, personal again, very personal we see that first of what comes on the table is risk assessment. And this might you know, uh, uh, avoid the implementation that could be rapid because you have so many constraints, con con constraint conditions uh, for, uh, for the implementation of some of these transitions uh, because of the risk in particular for some areas or some continents in the developing uh, world, in the south, global south, as, as we say. So you see, even if you think about uh, uh, the Green Climate Fund or other means of stimulating financially, uh, it is not easy. Uh, the money is not there. Uh, I just promised it's not there. So basically, there is a mistrust of the developing world, I would say. Please understand that these are absolutely personal a mistrust of the developing world, which thinks that we were not the ones that brought the situation as it stands. We want to help a lot, but also we don't see the promises. We don't see a fair, we want to, to use the equity, fair transition. 
And, uh, and this is an issue that I think uh, uh, should also be, be discussed. You know, when we think about bringing these issues of governance, and I think at some level it needs to be, uh, to the Climate Change Convention or to UN bodies, especially because you are thinking about broader things like, for instance, the impact of these options in sustainable development. These need so safeguards. We need to have something in place. And I think it's helpful. Uh, but, but when you bring this to a, a UN level, these discussions take so long and we don't have the time. <laughs> so we don't have the time, we need to be quick. So maybe we need to find a way to stimulate uh, action, you know, at least because we cannot think that we cannot do actions uh, that do not need to be brought to a, uh, to a UN level or, uh, but we can initiate like research, I think is something that we can do without too much constraint. Just some ideas yeah. popping up. Here. Can I just uh, follow up on one thing you said very briefly because we're we're getting to the end of this session? But you said that developing countries may be more flexible and more capacity, but that maybe to do uh, carbon removal because they're they're still at the early stages of development. At the same time, and as remarked by one of our participants, that. Uh, many of the developing countries like Global South, their industrialization policies are very, very much focused on carbon, uh, on fossil fuels. So uh, does that work? <laughs> how, how do you see that? Briefly, if you may, if you can. Well, I, I see this as a, a transition because they might not know other means quickly to change. Mm -hmm. So they need to have the opportunity to have options mm -hmm. for the development. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and I think this is missing. You know, we talk about technology transfer, we talk about financial, which is not everything. I mean, you know, uh, we are being simplistic in this discussion. We, say, we have several other uh, issues at domestic level, like the level of uh, the institutions, the strengthening the institutions, having policies in place, a good governance. So there is a lot there. But these, uh, you know, if we are waiting for the ideal world, this might, uh, you know, uh, how the actions that could uh, start. We look at the NDCs, you know, developing countries have put forward NDCs that are, uh, uh, that are not uh, constrained and others are, you know, they, so why not to explore those things? Well, we're coming to the end. What I'd like to do now is if uh, we have two minutes in total. So I'd like to ask each of you for 20, 30 seconds, just a quick thought on what do you expect uh, on the one hand in COP26 about these issues and beyond in the UNFCCC. So one is the UNFCCC process, you know, Framework Convention on Climate Change. And the other is what do you expect in some of the other key intergovernmental <clears throat> processes that are going forward? such as uh, the Biodiversity Convention, such as the IUCN's Congress next year. So there's a big things happening. Uh, anybody would like to start? 20, 30 seconds each. Thelma, very no, short. No, you up 26, very short. Yeah. One of them, Article 6. Okay. Article 6, uh, I think, needs to, you know, come to an end. And I hope it comes to an end in a way that doesn't <laughs> compromise uh, the, uh, the integrity of the whole process. Mm -hmm. So that is one. And then the next one, I know that the focus is gonna be on nature-based solutions. And I hope that we have an honest discussion on the potential for those solutions or options, as I like to say, uh, considering the limitations and potential of those options. Fantastic, thank you. Seconds. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Any other reactions? Yes, Julio, thank quick, you. Quick. Quick comment. Um, I think most of this discussion will be determined by how how much ambition is communicated in new NDCs and, and long term strategies, as, as Paul was saying. If if we don't see uh, uh, the needle moving in, in that regard, I think the urgency of a discussion about removals and and you know planning for for long term mitigation will will be shaking up a little bit. And, uh, and that will be seen in, in, in COP26. Uh, as you know, the, the, the Secretariat will prepare a synthesis report of all the NDCs presented this, in this coming year. 
and and that that would be a very important uh, topic to to to, to cover. Um, just a very 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 short uh, reference also. Uh, in COP26, we need to also discuss the uh, Coronivia joint work. Some of the aspects related to agriculture will look also into carbon into carbon in soils, um, and that might also spark a, a, an interesting conversation about uh, nature-based options or solutions, as you want to say to call it. Thank you, Paul. Very quickly, and then Bill. Okay, um, I can only echo uh, Telma in wanting to see Article 6 finished. Um, <laughs> that's in the capable hands now of my successor, Tosi, and I'm sure between the Chilean presidency and the UK presidency, I'm sure they will deliver. Uh, but I, 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 I do think it's important to see how that works, although I don't think it solves the the, the specific interactions with the areas we're talking about here today. So making sure the rules are in place for the Paris Agreement that moves forward. As Julio said, it's very much about the ambition. And I think seeing very clearly what we're doing, just as we were saying a few minutes ago, really bringing the emissions down needs to be very, very clear. And then finally, it's the interaction with the other processes. We also have the COP15 under biodiversity in, in China. Uh, there's also on the, the desertification side, there are these other interactions. We need to be working more closely together uh, mm -hmm. across conventions and in different areas and building the capacity uh, to, to look at those challenges across uh, different lines. Thank you, Paul. Bill, very briefly, please. Well, I, I like everyone, I'm hoping that our Article 6 comes to a conclusion. Um, but in an environmentally sound way, but I do worry if it does come to a conclusion, what will happen to the life, lives of the Article 6 negotiators? I think they won't know what to do with themselves. But uh, <laughs> standing back a bit, I think that um, what we're looking at now uh, with so many countries, China, the European Union, Japan, Korea, uh, likely a Biden um, presidency to be optimistic, we'd end up with uh, two thirds of the global economy under a greenhouse gas net zero goal for around 2050 or shortly afterwards uh, for the COP and a whole lot more I would imagine. So that means ambition will be back on the agenda big time. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna be optimistic about that and say that this could be a COP of, of um, you know, which establishes the momentum we really need. But one of the big issues that does worry me is where the nature-based solutions options as Thelma puts it as going because what I see from the industry uh, side is a very big emphasis on using nature-based offsets to continue to emit at scale mm -hmm. um, and I don't think we've thought our way around the implications of that uh, properly um, for actually achieving real emission reductions that would be a very serious hole below the waterline in the whole system if that if that became the case so I think that I agree with Thelma that needs to be a big issue at the COP. Thank you, Bill. And Stefan, uh, 10 seconds, last word. Yeah, ten, th yeah thank you for 10 seconds. <laughs> okay, 15. Um, <laughs> um, um, speaking for CAN or speaking as CAN, um, we are a little bit more skeptical. Um, we believe that the uh, UNFCC negotiations are uh, basically doing at best damage, damage limitations. They haven't delivered on many issues. They haven't delivered on loss and damage. They haven't delivered on ambition, they haven't delivered on Article 6, and even if they agree on Article 6, agreeing on Article 6 is not a goal, because we prefer no agreement on Article 6 rather than a kind of loophole which allows offsets, double counting, and other bad solutions. So going to be honest with you guys here. Um, what we believe is the real options um, happen somewhere else. We see national implementation. We believe that renewable energy implementation, energy efficiency, investments, technology innovation is very important. And that doesn't happen on the level of the UNFCCC, unfortunately. That happens nationally or regionally, if you want, um, in terms of legislation and implementation um, by governments and by countries. And that's where the focus is. We're going to be there, of course, because we need to be there. But we do not believe that COP, uh, what is it, 26 in Glasgow will be the breakthrough. It's damage limitation. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. And with that, thank you very much. Uh, this was a very interesting discussion. And uh, uh, thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Colleagues, good night. Good, good morning, whatever. Bye. Mm -hmm.